So it's uh, my pleasure and honor to introduce Professor Dima Yi, uh, who we're going to talk about holomorphic mass inequality, old and new. And then incidentally, I also, the first time I met Professor Dima Yi is also 32 years ago in Japan, the Sagadori campus. Uh, time flies. <laughs> okay, uh, Professor Dima Yi. Okay, uh, so first I would like to, to thank the organizers and especially Claude for the invitations to this uh, great event and uh, Xu Shong for the introduction. So I'm happy to uh, be able to talk with uh, all of you again, although it's a virtual communication. But anyway, uh, let me try to do my, my best in this, uh, this way. So I'm, I'm going to, to lecture about a subject that was a uh, my work when I st was still very young, so it was just after my, my PhD thesis, uh, so holomorphic Morse inequalities. But in the last 10 years, um, these uh, inequalities have been used to, to prove new things, and also uh, they've been uh, given a new form. So I'm going to, to give some sort of survey of uh, what happened uh, during this uh, long period. So um, let me first uh, give the, the general definitions and goals. So you take X to be a compact complex manifold and L over X, a holomorphic line bundle. And uh, you assume that it's equipped with a Hermitian metric H, which I write locally <clears throat> in a trivialization as exponential minus phi, where phi is usually a smooth function, but it might have also singularities in some cases. Okay, and then of course, as you all know, uh, you can define the curvature form of this Hermitian structure, which I will denote by theta LH or just a small theta for brevity. Uh, and it's uh, i over two pi del del bar phi uh, or minus i over two pi del del bar log h. And uh, one important problem uh, in algebraic or analytic geometry uh, in general is of course to compute cohomology groups. And especially you would like to have some sort of estimate in the form of upper and lower bounds for all cohomology groups so a small hq means the dimension of the comedy group of x into L tensor M tensor F, where F is any uh, coherent analytic sheaf. Uh, you don't expect to do this uh, exactly, but only asymptotically as the exponent M here goes to infinity. Um, well, you would like to do this in terms of uh, various invariants of L, but in this uh, context, you would like to express this in terms of the curvature form. And a harder question, uh, especially uh, in case you look at Q equals zero, namely holomorphic sections, and suppose say F is itself uh, an invertible uh, sheaf, then you would like to analyze the, the base locus uh, of those holomorphic sections, uh, namely the set of common zeros of all holomorphic sections globally on X. And uh, holomorphic Morse inequalities precisely uh, give some answers in terms of the Q index sets of the curvature form. So I'm going to define this. Uh, so it's an old work of mine from uh, 85. Uh, so let me uh, explain more. So you have this uh, theta, which is a one-one form. Of course, you can write it uh, in each point z as I sum of theta j k of z d z j, where which d z k bar, and then uh, it's given by a, a Hermitian matrix, and you can compute the signature at each point, and you take the set of points where uh, it's non-degenerate of signature uh, n minus q, q for any given uh, integer q. And of course, you get this picture. So you have some sort of chambers. So zero uh, corresponds to uh, all, all eigenvalues positive. 
uh, one here is uh, one negative eigenvalue, etc. So you may have all possibilities between zero and n. And the red parts are the transition between chambers and they correspond to the, uh, the vanishing of uh, the top power of, of, the, of the curvature. And of course you get uh, these chambers are open sets and the sign of theta to the n is minus one to the q on the, on the q chamber. And the main theorem is that you have an upper bound for an alternate sum of uh, cohomology groups from, from zero to degree Q, where you put here uh, an alternate uh, sign in such a way that it's plus for HQ, okay? So you put Q minus J, so you have plus for HQ. And then the bound is R is the rank of F. Uh, actually, the only thing in the right-hand side that depends on F is this rank, uh, or generic rank. And then uh, you multiply by the, uh, the power M to N, uh, M to the power N, uh, N is complex dimension of X, divided by N factorial, multiplied by a Morse integral. And the Morse integral is uh, given by the, the volume form theta to the n with the sign minus one to the q that makes it positive on the q chamber. And then of course you have uh, plus or minus signs depending wh whether you are on zero, one, two or q, okay? And then you have an error term which is of a lower order of magnitude compared to the leading term. In case q is n, uh, it's simply a, a weaker version of the standard riemann roch formula. And in, in the general analytic case, uh, you don't need any algebraicity to prove this, just a compact complex manifold. And the proof proceeds, for instance, by looking at the Dolbo uh, complex and looking at the spectral theory of the box bar operator, which is a Laplace Beltrami operator of, of del bar, uh, acting on, on sections of uh, L tensor N tensor F assuming say F locally free, but actually you can, you can reduce the situation to F locally free by blowing up. It's not, not very hard. So you can always assume F locally free to, to prove the theorem. Um, and then you truncate, you truncate the Debar complex by looking at uh, eigenspaces uh, such that the eigenvalues are less than some level. And then because of ellipticity, you get a finite dimensional complex uh, and you can compute asymptotically by using spectral theory, uh, the uh, dimensions of, of those uh, truncated complexes. And then you, uh, you do some sort of localization in the following way. So of course the curvature of L to the M is M times theta. Uh, and then you rescale coordinates by square root of m. So if you do that uh, by rescaling, uh, the curvature is somehow, you have to look at, at, at very small cubes of size, say one over square root of m. And then locally, of course, theta is continuous or so smooth. Don't vary, don't vary very much. And then you can asymptotically consider that the curvature is constant. And when everything is constant, well, you are reduced to, to computing on CN somehow. And then uh, you have the model case where you can compute everything, the eigenfunction, the eigenvalues. And this localization idea um, gives in fact the result. So it's, it's not very hard. And uh, now I'm giving some uh, um, alternative formulations. So of course a weaker version without taking the alternate sum is just an upper bound. So in that case, you look just at HQ uh, and then what you need is just the Q chamber here. And of, of course it's weaker and it's obtained by uh, summing the alternate sums from a zero to Q and you get the, the HQ bound. Uh, you also get a lower bound 
uh, it's easy to see in that case that the lower bound is obtained by taking three chambers. So you have the Q chamber, but you have to take also the Q minus one and the Q plus one. Okay. And so the, the Q chamber counts with plus sign and the two neighboring chambers now because of this sign minus one to the Q are counted negatively. So you subtract, so it's less than this one. And it's a lower bound. And especially, uh, this is very interesting for a Q equals zero, because then you get a lower bound for the number of holomorphic sections. And then uh, you have to take the zero chamber minus what happens on the one chamber. Uh, and therefore, if this integral here, this Morse integral is positive, you have a sufficient condition for the existence of holomorphic sections which is useful in, uh, in many, many contexts. Now I will need also in this lecture, a singular version. So um, in that case, uh, you assume that H here may have singularity. So it's no longer smooth, but you assume at least it has analytic singularities. So analytic singularities means that uh, the weight is locally a constant C positive multiplied by the logarithm of a sum of squares of holomorphic functions modulo a smooth term U. So at least well, the singularities are an analytic in that sense. And it's, of course, this part is plurisub harmonic, but here you don't assume positivity for the curvature. If you would take only this, of course, you would have I delta bar of phi positive, but then the smooth term allows you to have some negative part in the curvature. And then, uh, well, you cannot have exactly the same uh, bounds because of the singularities. And in fact, the proof goes through L2 estimates so you have to introduce what people call the multiply ideal sheaf, which was introduced by Nadel uh, and uh, then a, a lot of people, uh, Sue, and I worked also quite a lot on this. So, uh, so of course, if you take the, uh, the bundle L to the tensor M, now the weight becomes exponential minus M phi. And then you have to introduce the corresponding multiplied ideal sheaf, which is the sheaf of holomorphic functions f, which are L2 with respect to this weight. And uh, it turns out that this is always a coherent analytic sheaf. Well, it's clear in this situation, but even for phi an arbitrary plurisubarmonic function, somehow you extract only the analytic uh, singularities and you still get a, a coherent sheaf even for arbitrary singularities. And then uh, Bonavero in his PhD thesis uh, 96 proved that the holomorphic Morse inequalities still hold provided you twist the comedy groups by these uh, multiply ideal sheaves. Okay, so you have to correct uh, the sheaf here by taking into account the L2 estimates. And uh, then you have exactly the same uh, bounds, which I, I don't repeat, just with this re replacement, you, you have to end the multiply ideal sheaves. And on the right hand side, the only thing that you are doing is just integrating in the complement of the singular set. So the singular set is the set where these functions uh, gj here uh, vanish, which correspond to phi equal uh, minus infinity. Okay, so you remove the, the singular set and you, you integrate on the complement. And because of this assumption, uh, the, uh, the integral is always finite uh, in the complement. And you get uh, exactly the, uh, the same estimates. The, the proof is not very hard. Um, it's just obtained by blowing up. So by blowing up, you can uh, transform the ideal sheaves into invertible sheaves uh, by uh, standard techniques. And then 
you are reduced essentially to the smooth case after uh, canceling the, the divisor that comes from uh, from the, uh, the the transform here of, of, of the singularity into a divisor. Okay, so that's uh, that was the story uh, in the mid nineties. Uh, but then, uh, of course, this is uh, highly analytic. So uh, algebraic geometers would like to have some sort of algebraic translation of the Morse inequalities. So one, one case where it is easy to formulate is when you take the line bundle on a projective uh, algebraic variety over C, and you assume it's given by a difference A minus B of uh, ample or even uh, NEF divisors. So NEF means just uh, that um, A dot C for every curve is non-negative, which is the same as being a limit of, of Q, Q ample divisors. Uh, so in that case, Um, one can easily obtain a lower bound uh, in terms of intersection numbers. So uh, you take the top intersection uh, A to the N, which is the same as uh, C1 of A to the N, minus N times A to the N minus one times B. Uh, and then you have this, this exactly replaces the, the Morse integral that you had in the general analytic case. And this was observed by uh, several people, including uh, Stefano Trapani in 95, and also Catanese. And uh, the proof can be obtained also from the general analytic case because you have this pointwise inequality. Um, so here you take the characteristic function of the, uh, of the Q index sets, where at, at most Q, and you take a difference of two semi-positive forms of type 1, 1, alpha, and beta. Um, and then if you take alpha minus beta to the N and multiply by the characteristic function of the uh, at most Q index set, then it's pointwise less then the alternate sum of what you would get by the binomial expansion, but you have to truncate uh, for powers of beta that are less than Q, okay? It's just a very uh, simple uh, linear algebra or a, a symmetric function argument that gives this. Uh, it's interesting also analytically because it's true even if alpha and beta are not closed. And that's somehow a situation that you might have that alpha and beta are, uh, are such that alpha minus beta is closed, but you express you express a, a closed form as a difference of non-closed forms. And somehow this provides more flexibility that is sometimes useful. A uh, completely algebraic proof was given by Flavio Angelini in, in his PhD thesis, so he's a student of Rob Lassesfeld. Uh, so you can get it uh, exact sequence arguments. So you essentially, uh, well, you look at essentially a standard exact sequence. So uh, you may assume A very ample, say, and then uh, you, uh, you write this, you multiply by, uh, or you do it for B and you multiply by O of A and then you consider exact sequences and so on. So it's a not so difficult uh, algebraic proof. Um, unfortunately, it turns out that I will give later a, an application of the Morse inequalities where definitely this algebraic version is too weak. Uh, so it, this algebraic version is, is definitely not equivalent somehow, uh, even in algebraic context, it's, it's definitely weaker and there is no way you can prove some of the result that you can attain by the analytic formulation with this uh, version. And it turns out that Benoit Cadorel, uh, two years ago, 
found a more general purely algebraic formulation that is definitely stronger. So he has to introduce what he calls uh, adapted stratifications. So instead, instead of taking as before uh, a minus b globally on x, you do it step by step. Okay, so step by step means that you take a stratification by a strata that are uh, of lower and lower dimension. Well, you, you, you start with the top one, Sn. Sn is, is x. And then, well, on, on x, of course, you can write L in the algebraic case uh, as OX of a divisor, say dn minus one. So this refers to dimension. And of course, you can write this divisor as a difference of two non negative divisors, two positive divisors. Okay. But then you continue. So, uh, so you have X here. And then you have uh, S, uh, S uh, you have this divisor, which is supported um, on some components. But then of course you have intersections. So you want, you want to do it uh, on non-singular schemes. So inductively, you are, what you are going to do is to take a resolution of singularity of this first step, and then you iterate the construction. Okay, so, so the construction is you, you will have um, actually a, a proper birational morphism, which I denote by psi j from sj onto the support of a divisor of sj plus one inductively. Um, and then you compose, okay, so uh, you compose your, your, your morphisms to get actually a a birational morphism from Sj onto something in X. Uh, so, so that when you pull back L by this composition uh, phi J, then uh, it will itself be given on, on the non singular scheme uh, Sj as a divisor dj minus one, which you write again as a difference. And you do it until you reach uh, dimension zero. Okay, and now uh, given this uh, construction, you introduce uh, what uh, Cadorel called the truncated powers of the Chan class, which he denotes as C1L relative to the stratification S to the power K, and then Q is the truncation uh, index. So you proceed by induction. So the zeros power essentially uh, is the, well, is the, fundamental class for index zero. And then you take zero if Q is, is different from zero. Okay, so this is the zero step. Now inductively, the case power uh, lives, uh, is, is defined as a codimension K cycle that is supported on the, uh, the codimension K uh, stra stratum. And it's given by intersecting the k minus one power for truncation q with the d plus part uh, of uh, dimension n minus k minus uh, the, the power k minus one dot the negative part. Okay, so this defines inductively uh, these uh, truncated powers. And then the theorem uh, stated by Kedorel in a paper now accepted, I think, uh, in uh, an Ecole Normale Supérieure. Um, so it's an archive paper from uh, 2019, gives that the alternate sum of dimensions of comedy groups is less than the at most Q truncation of the top uh, truncated power. So here it means that you take the sum, the sum of these uh, truncations from zero to Q. Modulo some error term, which is of lower order. And the, the proof is quite similar to what uh, Flavio Angelini did 
except that it's slightly more involved because you change the divisor at each step, but the proof is, is very similar and it's not very hard. And now it turns out that uh, most of the applications I know, in the algebraic situation at least, uh, this is strong enough to prove uh, the consequences that I will describe later. And now I, I would like to come to some considerations about the, uh, the base locus problem. So of course, as I already hinted, if you assume that the, uh, the, inter the Morse integral uh, for index at most one of theta to the n is strictly positive, then you know that the bundle is big. Namely, it has a lot of sections for large powers. Uh, it is ma maximal gross. Uh, C times M to the uh, complex dimension N. But of course, this doesn't tell you anything precise about the, the base locus. Uh, base locus of L is by definition the intersection of the zero sets of all uh, sections in all positive powers. But actually, this is a bit hard to compute, so I'm more interested in what I call the iterated base locus. So the iterated base locus is defined a little bit like uh, Cadorel uh, defined. So you start with x, and then you take the zero divisor of a section in any power, and then you look at the irreducible components, or alternatively, you look at the normalization of, of the zero set. And then you look again at sections that exist on the zero locus. And you, you iterate. So you take all sections on, on the zero locus, and then you, you take the zeros of the sections on the zero locus. At some stage, of course, you might have only zero sections. And then you take the intersection for all uh, iterations, uh, all choices of the uh, of the exponents, and all choices of the sections of all these zero sets. Uh, this is what I call the iterated base locus. So it's definitely quite interesting for some applications, although it's uh, it's more complicated to define. Of course, it's always smaller than the base locus because you might have sections that that are. Uh, defined on some zero locus that don't extend to the whole manifold. Uh, here is a very interesting problem, but unfortunately uh, completely unsolved. I would like to find a condition, for instance, in the form of some Morse integrals or something similar, for instance, for the curvature form, ensuring uh, that the dimension of the iterated base locus is larger than some value. So I would like to know that the iterated base locus is small, for instance. Uh, of course, one possibility is to just restrict the Morse integrals to those uh, loci. Of course, if you have a, a Z a irreducible uh, subvariety in X, you can compute the integral over z of the curvature form and compute uh, the uh, one index uh, more, most integral are on it. And if you know this is strictly positive, then you produce sections on, on z. But the point is that you don't know what will be z, of course, because z uh, is a section on which you already have very little control. But on the other hand, you know it's a section provided by a, 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 a line bundle whose curvature is governed by theta. So you hope that this z somehow depend in some very complicated way in, on theta, and that possibly you can derive some sort of for control on this uh, integrals, uh, seemingly on, on random uh, z's from information just on theta. It's not completely unlikely because actually analytically, uh, if you take the average for instance, the first stage, if you take the average of all sections that you obtain at the first stage, 
it's definitely um, possible to express this uh, by the Crofton formula in terms of theta itself as an upper envelope of metrics on theta. So it's not completely unlikely that you can, in the end, uh, find some, some more tractable expression that would control this problem. But I, I, unfortunately, I, I cannot solve in general. I will give a, some sort of partial solution at the end. But I, I don't know uh, how to solve in general. Um, of course, Morse inequalities are also useful in, in the purely transcendental uh, context, especially uh, they were initially found, uh, I was motivated by Sue's proof of uh, the grauer riemann schneider conjecture that characterizes moistures and manifolds. And there you don't assume any sort of algebraicity. You, you take just a compact complex manifold. Uh, the criterion is that X is Moishezon. If and only if there exists a line bundle LH, but you have to allow H singular here with analytic singularities such that the Morse integral, uh, of course, minus singularity of, of the curvature is strictly positive. So you don't assume any algebraicity, but in the end, you know, this condition will imply that X is moistison and therefore is algebraic uh, well, in the sense of our thin spaces. Okay, but now I have a, a conjecture that doesn't even assume that you have a, an integral class. So now you take uh, a Botchan class. So it's a one one, it's represented by one one forms. Uh, in Botchan cohomology, it means that you, you look at forms that are D closed, but they are taken modulo uh, that del bar of functions, okay, for one one groups. And then you get a finite dimensional group, which is defined even in the non projective or non Kähler case. Um, and then in this context, it's interesting to define uh, what I call the volume of the class. So the volume here is the supremum for all positive currents contained in the class of what you would get if it were smooth by taking the nth power. Of course, you cannot because it's a current but what you can do is to use the Lebesgue decomposition. So you will, the, the coefficients are measures. So you can take the absolutely continuous part plus the singular part in the sense of Lebesgue. And then the absolutely continuous part is pointwise defined. You can take the nth power and you take the supremum of all this. And it, it gives you a value, which I call the volume. This assumes alpha pseudo effective, namely that there are such currents. If there are not, you define the volume to be zero. And then the conjecture is that this volume is given exactly as in the case of uh, algebraic Morse inequalities by taking, sorry, that's a mistake here. It should be uh, the, at most one index. Uh, of course, it will, it will be less than the zero uh, term, but it should be larger than, uh, okay, so it's the, here for J, it's a J index set. Okay, so you expect exactly the same lower bound as in the, uh, in the algebraic case. Um, it turns out that this conjecture is very hard. I, I've tried a lot, maybe since 25 years, but. It, uh, still unknown. Uh, it would give uh, a lot of information for um, Kähler or even non-Kähler manifolds. For instance, in the Kähler case, so if X is compact Kähler, you take alpha beta to be a uh, NEF classes. So in, in the Kähler case, NEF means that you are in the closure of the Kähler cone. So you take the Kähler cone, uh, you take Kähler forms, and then you take the, the closure in, in H11. This, this is by definition the NEF cone. So you take two such uh, NEF classes, and then the volume of the difference 
should be bounded below by this uh, intersection uh, number alpha to the n minus n alpha to the n minus one dot beta. And uh, this conjecture would yield a characterization of the dual of the pseudo effective cone on an arbitrary compact Keller manifold. So it's not just for the sake of, uh, of generality, but it gives you also some very precise information on the positive cones. Uh, the first observation that we uh, made in our uh, paper with uh, Buxom and uh, Aaron Peternel in 2004 was that this is true, of course, if X can be approximated by the formation that are projective algebraic. So you suppose X is a limit by the, uh, on the deformation of a, in a family uh, of X nu with maximal Picard number. So the Picard number of, of the uh, X nu uh, should be equal to the Hodge number H11. In that case, uh, you can approximate your NEF classes by uh, say ample classes on the X nu and you go to the limit and you get it. However, mm, Clairvoisin has shown that you don't ha always have uh, appro such approximations. And in fact, you have some sort of exotic uh, ke compact Keller manifolds which don't have such uh, deformations. Nevertheless, more recently, uh, Jian Chao in uh, 2015, and then Popovici uh, gave a better proof in 16, at least that if this uh, difference here is strictly positive, then you know that alpha minus beta is a big class, namely the volume is strictly positive, you do have inside a Keller current. Uh, of course, it doesn't give the, uh, the expected value for the volume, they have only a weaker, uh, they have a formula, but a weaker one. But still, it's, it's good. Uh, more recently, uh, David uh, Nistrom and uh, Sebastian Buxom, a uh, paper published in uh, 2019, proved that uh, this works at least if X is projective, but you don't assume alpha and beta to be uh, algebraic classes, so they are arbitrary transcendental 1 1 classes, and then the volume estimates works. The proof is rather involved. Um, so I don't know what has to be done in the, in the general situation. The one idea, of course, is to try to work in symplectic category or, and approximate uh, the, uh, the complex classes by, by topological line bundles and try to do the same as you, you did in the holomorphic case. So you're almost holomorphic, so its ideas are similar to what uh, Simon Donaldson did. Uh, but I, still couldn't get uh, a complete proof. Uh, although I've definitely an approach, but it seems quite hard. Okay, now, now in the remaining uh, time, I would like to discuss application to uh, the study of uh, hyperbolicity questions in the sense of uh, Kobayashi and uh, study of entire curves in protective varieties. So you are here interested in the study of uh, holomorphic curves from the complex line C into a projective uh, variety over complex numbers. And as is well known, uh, such a variety is said to be uh, Kobayashi hyperbolic and equivalently uh, body hyperbolic if there are no such curves. Uh, more generally, you may be interested in the logarithmic case. So in that case, you, you take a normal crossing divisor delta, uh, reduced, and you take the complement of the support, x minus delta, and you want to study uh, holomorphic curves that sit entirely in the complement. Uh, so here's the picture. So in, in green here, you have the image of a curve that doesn't touch the, the components of, of the divisor delta. And if there are no such curves, uh, you say that the logarithmic pair x delta is body hyperbolic. Uh, 
for the study, uh, the, the idea is that these curves are not random. And actually what I'm going to prove is that if you have such a curve, then it has to satisfy under suitable conditions, algebraic differential equations. So they, they are not, of course, if, if you take Pn, you cannot expect this because in Pn, you have a lot of entire curves. Simply take any n plus one tuple of uh, entire functions, simplify the zeros and it gives you a completely random uh, holomorphic curve into Pn. So Pn is no limitation somehow so you cannot expect any sort of algebraicity of, of those curves. But if X is say of general type, uh, then the, uh, the entire curves are constrained um, by, by the geometry and you expect uh, that these curves will have a much more algebraic behavior. And that's a quite interesting uh, problem because it's expected to be related also to uh, arithmetic issues. For instance, the question of uh, understanding the loci of, um, of uh, rational points on uh, varieties of general type and such question that are very deep uh, extensions of the uh, of the Felting's theorem uh, on the model conjecture. Uh, so you expect such a relation and may even expect that the, uh, the transcendental results will help in giving methods that apply to the arithmetic problem. But here uh, I'm, going, I'm only concerned with the, uh, the geometric problem of trying to understand uh, what are those curves. Okay, so for this, you introduce uh, cage at bundles. So uh, take a non singular n dimensional projective variety. And then you introduce coordinates, local coordinates. And then if you have a holomorphic curve into X or germ, just a germ. So this means uh, that the curve is defined only in a neighborhood of zero. Okay, it's. A sm small germ of curve. Um, so you write it as an n-tuple in local coordinates. And then uh, you're going to write in those coordinates uh, the Taylor expansion at any order k. And so uh, x is the initial point at zero. And then you have the derivative c1, second derivative c2, uh, up to factor two. And then you look at the Taylor expansion and then the, you neglect the higher order terms. And uh, you look at the equivalence classes, modulo higher order terms. And this is what you call a k-jet of curve. Okay, so the k-jet of curve is completely determined by the initial point and the first k uh, derivatives. And uh, then I will denote by jk of x, the bundle of k jet of curves together with its projection pi k from jk of x to x. Uh, so the fiber just consists of those k jets which start at point x here. Okay, and then they are parameterized by, uh, so the fiber coordinates are given by c1, c2, ck. Now I'm going to introduce uh, algebraic differential operators. So a k-jet of curve can be uh, viewed as a k-tuple uh, given by the derivative at uh, the origin. And then you have a c-star action. The c-star action is not multiplication by lambda, but it's reparameterization by changing the speed of time. Okay, so you replace the time parameter t by lambda t. And of course, if you look at the case derivative by time, uh, you take say the, uh, the s derivative, of course, you, what comes out is lambda to the s by uh, elementary calculus. So in this way, you get a, a weighted action you get a weighted action on, on the yeah. derivatives. Uh, so lambda on the first derivative, but lambda square on the second and lambda to the k on the k derivative. 
uh, if you take a local connection, of course, you can identify JK of X to K copies of the tangent bundle. Although, of course, it's completely non-intrinsic. Uh, and uh, well, in that case, uh, you have some sort of uh, trivialization given by iterating the connection on F, which of course is one way of computing given the connection nabla. Uh, what is called the green sheaf EKM of homogeneous polynomials of weighted degree M uh, consists of polynomials on the fibers of the jet bundle uh, that are holomorphic in uh, the variable X and polynomial uh, in, in the fiber coordinates, so in the de derivatives here. But you want them to be homogeneous with respect to this C star action. So it means precisely that the condition on, on the uh, exponents here is that the sum of S times the length of alpha S is M. So it's degree with respect to the weighted C star action. Alternatively, well, you assume the coefficients to be holomorphic. And alternatively, you can view such a polynomial as a differential operator acting on the germ of curve. Simply then you plug here uh, the derivatives and you replace X by uh, the, the point reached by the curve. You can do this at zero, but you can do this also at any time. Okay, and in this way, uh, you get a holomorphic function of, of T uh, that depends algebraically on the derivatives of uh, the components of the curve. And then you get the graded algebra of uh, algebraic differential operators of this type which of course is a pure polynomial algebra uh, is generated just by the, um, the uh, derivatives uh, of, of order less than K uh, of all components of the curve. And this expression now has to be considered of degree S. So here K refers to the maximal order of derivatives and M is the total degree in EKM. And of course, you have this change of formula, a change of coordinates formula. Of course, uh, it's a highly nonlinear. If you change, if you change the coordinates on the manifold by some uh, bilomorphism C, then uh, for the S derivative, it will be linear in the top derivative, but highly nonlinear in, in the lower order derivatives. By it's the composition law for, for derivatives. But what you see is that uh, this expression is a, always a polynomial of weight degree S. So at least you get the holomorphic bundle. Uh, you can see by this formula that you have a, a, a multi-filtration that is given by the partial degrees in the various derivatives. And if you take the total uh, graded parts of, of, of this multi-filtration, what you get is easy to see. It's a direct sum of some uh, symmetric powers of the cotangent bundle. Uh, for this uh, weighted uh, degree conditions on, on, the, uh, on the, the exponents here in the symmetric powers. So you have at least uh, modulo this filtration, some sort of geometric understanding of the Bernal from which you can compute, for instance, chunk classes or whatever. And that helps a lot in the geometry. You can do the same same for logarithmic jet differential. I'm going to be rather short on this. So in that case, uh, you also, so you're going to uh, take coordinates so that your components are just given by the coordinates. And in that case, you add in the operators also the derivative of the logarithm of F. Uh, 
and then you see that you have to to take also a purely polynomial algebra but then you have to take the inverse of the components uh, that correspond to the components of your divisor delta j here so it's a very similar thing except that you change here by some sort of logarithmic derivatives and then you have a, a corresponding multifiltration on, on, on the differential operators and a corresponding expression here of the graded parts in terms of the symmetric powers of the logarithmic uh, cotangent bundle. So I'm going to be rather short on this uh, case. And if you take the quotient by the C star action now, uh, you get, which is recalled here, you, it's the same as the proj of uh, this graded algebra that I introduced. And then you get a bundle in, in weighted projective spaces over X. So these weighted projective spaces of some quotient singularities, uh, they, are, they are just quotients, the fibers, just quotients of Cn to the K minus zero by the, uh, the C star action that I already wrote. And correspondingly, you have a tautological rank one sheaf, uh, OXK of M, uh, which is invertible when M is a multiple of uh, the lowest common multiple of one, two, K. And by definition, uh, the direct image of this tautological sheaf, OXK of M, is precisely the bundle of polynomials, uh, which is the same as the bundle of differential operators, uh, EKM of X. And of course, you have this exactly the same in the logarithmic case. Um, you take, in that case, the proj of uh, the algebra of uh, logarithmic uh, differential operators, and you have a corresponding uh, direct image formula in the regardmic case. Okay, and now we can state a rather um, optimistic, maybe, conjecture. Uh, so you take a log pair of general type. So this means that if you take uh, the canonical bundle of the pair, which is by definition, the canonical bundle of X plus the boundary divisor delta, so you assume this to be big, and you say it's of general type. Then you expect that there will exist a proper algebraic variety Y in X, or X minus delta, but of course it will compactify uh, by taking the closure in X, uh, that will contain all entire curves uh, drawn in the complement X minus delta. So they will all be uh, algebraically degenerate somehow. That, that there will be an algebraic locus, uh, and therefore a smallest, uh, by taking the intersection of all those, there will be a, some, some Zarisk closure of, of, of all entire curves. There will be a proper variety containing all the entire curves. And this is precisely this smallest uh, locus that is expected to have uh, arithmetic properties uh, in, the, uh, in the arithmetic situation. So uh, conjecturally, it's a very important locus. Uh, you would like to compute it. So one idea is to try to find all those differential equations and hopefully uh, this locus could be related to uh, the zero locus of those differential equations. Uh, there is one, at, at least one direction that is true. So it's what I call the fundamental the vanishing theorem, which was observed by Green Griffiths in 79 and then reproved in wider generality by, by me and also by Xu and Yang in 96. So you, you fix an ample divisor A and then you look at all global uh, polynomial differential operators, well, say in the logarithmic situation, but twisted by O of minus A. So it means that you look at those operators such that the coefficients vanish on A. 
Okay, so you have some small condition that the coefficients have to vanish somewhere. And then the conclusion is that for all anti-curves, automatically there will be solutions of those global operators. Um, so you might expect whether the locus here of entire curves is exactly given by those uh, sections, and the answer unfortunately is no. Uh, in general, the, the locus given by those operators is bigger. Um, so it was observed already by Mark Green, I think, uh, also by uh, Serge Lang. And there was uh, there were examples also given by Diverio and Rousseau more recently, uh, more examples. But I'm not completely sure about the iterated base locus. So the, for the base locus, it's wrong. But for the iterated base locus, it might still be OK. Um, I'm not completely sure about the iterated base locus. So I think the question is still open. OK, I will not be very long on the fundamental vanishing theorem. It's actually a very easy theorem. So essentially, you plug uh, the curve and you observe that you have to do it for a body curve with bounded derivative because of the body lemma. Then you have a bounded function, but a, a bounded function on the complex line is, is constant. But because it has to vanish somewhere, uh, it has to be zero. So that's essentially the proof. So it's a rather easy theorem. OK, so I skip this. And now I come to the uh, an application of the Morse inequalities. So this is a paper that was uh, appeared in the uh, a Pure and Applied Mathematical Quarterly in uh, 2011 and a recent work for logarithmic case. So you fix Hermitian structures on, on the logarithmic tangent bundle, uh, and an ample line bundle with a positive uh, curvature. And then you take the curvature of the canonical bundle of that logarithmic pair, and you can find a singular metric such that if you subtract epsilon times omega a, this will be positive uh, if, if this is big, uh, because a big line bundle uh, uh, possesses a, a singular metric of strictly positive curvature. Now you twist the uh, tautological line bundle by some negative uh, multiple of a, and if to use those weights here. So you, you of course, it's slightly, um, well, depends on k, but it's still negative. It's a q-line bundle. And then for a sufficiently large power m, it will become a, a, a genuine uh, line bundle. And then the Morse inequalities will tell you that you have sections that grow like a Morse integral given precisely by the, this uh, curvature form of the canonical bundle minus epsilon a. Modulo some small error term would decays very slowly as one over log k. So k has to be extremely large. You have extremely slow convergence as the order of the, so you have to take an a number of derivative that is extremely large to get convergence, but nevertheless, it works. And in case you assume big, of course, it will produce sections. And as a consequence, uh, you will get a lot of algebraic differential equations. So my time is almost over, so I'm going to be rather short on the proof. So you first produce a Finsler metric on the k dot bundle. So you take the derivative and you have to take essentially one over s here because of the C star action. So it's a Finsler metric that is a weighted Finsler metric. It's compatible with the, uh, the C star action. It turns out that if you multiply by very small numbers that decay when you increase the order of derivatives, you have somehow an asymptotic formula 
that you can compute the curvature of this in terms of the curvature tensor of, of the tangent bundle. So surprisingly, this compu complicated uh, Finsler metric has a rather simple uh, expression uh, for, for the curvature of the tautological uh, line bundle. And then you uh, use polar coordinates. Uh, so you uh, take uh, the unit vector uh, corresponding to the S derivative here. And then uh, the curvature form becomes even simpler. Along the fibers, it's just a Fubinish 2D metric, uh, weighted Fubinish 2D metric. And along the base, it's some expression that depends on the curvature tensor of, of Tx here, or minus Tx. It's the curvature tensor of minus Tx with respect to H here, the coefficients there. And then you can compute the Morse integrals for this expression. Of course, there are some errors due to the epsilons. And you have to integrate on a very huge space, of course, which is the k-jet bundle. And then you do some more uh, simplifications. So you, it turns out that it's a quadratic form in terms of the, uh, of, of the US, which is the derivative CS divided by its norm. And the fact that it's a quadratic form, of course, helps in the integral because when you integrate on a sphere, a quadratic form, you get the trace. And here it's some sort of a sum, and you have some sort of Monte Carlo approximation that occurs because you take a very large, when k goes to infinity, you have a very large number of terms. And this sum is approximated by an integral. And the integral, uh, gives the trace, and this is why uh, now the canonical bundle appears because the trace of the curvature tensor is just a, is just the curvature of the determinant. So this is the reason. So it's a probabilistic reason that you converge to uh, to the uh, the canonical bundle. And now I come to the final uh, statement. Now you would like to know about the base locus. Okay, uh, this is a very recent result of mine, so only a few weeks ago. I realized that you can improve the estimates and obtain some result on the base locus. Of course, the base locus could possibly lead to the green griffiths conjecture if you would be able to control very tightly. Um, so what I get is as follows. You take in the k -jet bundle a complete intersection and the complete intersection is given by a priori by polynomials of this type. But now you assume that they are given by polynomials of some order. And you assume that you have not too many such polynomials. So the sum of the one over SJ should be small compared to log K. So in some sense, it's small compared to the sum of one over S for S because between one and, and k. So you, you have somehow only a small proportion of, of all derivatives involved. Okay, and then you can, in that case, compute the Morse integrals on those complete intersections and prove that they are positive for k large enough. And therefore, you are able to produce sections not just on the whole xk, but also on all these complete intersections. And so now you wonder whether this is enough to uh, imply the green griffiths conjecture. But unfortunately, uh, this restriction is a bit too much. Uh, it falls short of, of the full proof of the conjecture. And I don't see how you could use. But there is something I've not used. It's the fact that you don't only have an algebra, you have also a Lie algebra because you have a, a, a Lie bracket of uh, algebraic differential operators. And somehow you can differentiate the operators by using themselves. Uh, putting all these things together, hopefully might lead to a proof of the Gungifis contract. I don't know, but um, at this stage, I'm, I'm completely stuck. Um, so this is a situation right now. Uh, 
of course, a general answer about the, uh, the base locus problem in the context of holomorphic Morse inequalities would be possibly useful. So um, I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much for your attention.